Episode 341, Northwestern University's Queen. At the same time, the fourth son was in the Miller family's old house, where he stayed these days. His subordinates were reporting Zeke's affairs to him. These past few days, Jack's side had kept moving. Even after searching for a long time, the fourth son still couldn't find out who was the one who helped Jack decode the program, so he had sent someone to keep an eye on him. Although the Miller family was already under his control, he still felt vaguely uneasy because Jack had retrieved the only remaining direct bloodline. He knew that the Miller family wouldn't last for many years if they relied on Jack. The only reason why Jack had persisted on and found a decoder for the program was because of Zeke's existence. There wasn't a day that passed that he didn't regard Zeke as the thorn in his side. However, Zeke had never left any usable information against him. Not only that, but he was still successful in the entertainment industry and had made many connections. Closing the file in his hand, the fourth son's eyes were cold. Bessie is the old man's granddaughter? Yes, the subordinate replied. The fourth son placed his hands on the table and sneered. She was hidden so well. If it hadn't been exposed on the internet today, even he wouldn't have found her. Thinking of something, the subordinate glanced at him hesitantly. The fourth son looked up and noticed the glance. Go on, he said. When our men were following James, we found another woman. The subordinate lowered his head, looking puzzled. It seems like James has another daughter. The fourth son stood up, feeling puzzled. Look it up for me. I want to know what Zeke has hidden from me. Sierra had previously been very popular. However, the Soup Corporation terminated their contract with her after the show. There were no secrets in the entertainment industry, and the other companies didn't dare to sign a contract with her after the Soup Corporation dropped her. Sierra moved out of the Soup Corporation's housing after returning from Hawaii. Fortunately, she had garnered several loyal fans by this point. In the first episode of 24-Hour Idol, Sierra was the funniest from beginning to end. The netizens laughed at her for solving the question even without recognizing that the question was wrong. An account called Wish You a Cool Breeze was the president of Sierra's fan support club. After watching this episode, she was completely shaken and wanted to abandon Sierra. But in the end, she also suspected Bessie had been given a script by the production crew, much like the other netizens especially since the hot search trends disappeared one by one, and by three o'clock, not one was left. Her suspicion grew from 30% to 70%. She sent a message to Sierra. Did the production crew force you to help her set up her character? Sierra followed the fan support account on Twitter. She naturally saw her message and clicked to read it. The program broadcast had a great impact on Sierra, she had answered the question without knowing it was wrong, and the production crew had even given it to her. It was obvious that she was the one who had gotten the character set up. She pursed her lips. She hadn't expected the netizens to be focused on Bessie without easing up. Because her performance seemed to defy nature, every netizen's attention was focused on her. Seeing this message, Sierra's eyes lit up, and she sent a reply to her. Yes. This single word sounded so aggrieved to wish you a cool breeze. Anger bubbled in her. She watched the program's episode again. She spent all night working on a Twitter thread. Finally, she posted it. Regarding this idol show, I just have three questions. One, for the first physics question, she didn't even look at it from beginning to end, which was also pointed out by Katie's cousin in the show. So, how did she know that there was no correct answer and the question was wrong? Two, she said she's from Northwestern University's Science and Technology Department. Do these people study the Babylonian literature? Can they tell the weak system at a glance? Video screenshot. Three, the most ridiculous thing is the scene with the violins. Is there anyone who can copy the music composition after hearing these two songs? Without using any paper, she can even conjure the notes out of thin air and can even find the two overlapping points. 
I'm afraid she must be a musical genius. Video screenshot. All in all, I think it's seriously disgusting how they pulled another actress off the show just to promote someone. And let's not talk about how she's a school nerd from Northwestern University. The production crew shouldn't highlight that they're scared of Northwestern University's school nerds now and bring haters to them. The people I know from Northwestern University aren't like this. Smiley face. The show was broadcast on Saturday night. When Wish You a Cool Breeze posted on Twitter at 5 in the morning, most people were still asleep. As the president of Sierra's fan support club, she also had followers. Her Twitter post became popular as soon as it was posted. The traffic increased sharply at 7 a.m. 24-hour idol had completely exploded on the internet because of Zeke. So many people searched about it. The analysis of the production crew's script from Wish You a Cool Breeze was well documented and even showed screenshots as evidence. This Twitter post quickly rose to the hot search. Some people commented on this post to comfort Sierra. I scolded you in the comments last night. Let me apologize to you here. This actress with the last name M eats too ugly. She can't even set up her character properly. I'll bet a million dollars that she just wants to shoot to fame in the entertainment circle. I already said that Sierra is a simple girl. How could she collapse like that in the show? Production crew, please be more humane. When Sierra woke up and opened her Twitter, she realized she had gained tens of thousands of followers. Many people even sent her private messages to comfort and apologize to her. She clicked on the post from Wish You a Cool Breeze. After avoiding her for so long, her manager called her for the first time and instructed her, Your fans have done a great job. They'll help you clear your name and return to the path of fame. If this continues, we can still receive non-biased advertisements. Don't participate in this matter anymore. Zeke Miller and the Soup Corporation aren't good to provoke. Sierra hung up. She stared at her rising follower count. Then, looked at Ava's Twitter, which was nearing 7 million fans. She wasn't reconciled with this tiny gain. Since last night, the Soup Corporation hadn't issued a statement yet. The production crew's broadcast yesterday was obviously a trick for Bessie to bring hatred to her, and they dared to broadcast it this way. Hadn't President Soup instructed them to broadcast it this way? Sierra's eyes flickered, and she got up from her seat staring out the narrow window. She was left with almost nothing now. After a long while, she posted on Twitter, Thank you, everyone. This post was equivalent to her silently acknowledging the production crew's operation. It instantly brought a huge number of fans for her. Countless comments were comforting her. Her post instantly brought the production crew into a conspiracy theory and the matter was blown up further. At the same time, Zeke arrived at the Park Place Apartments. He had come over early in the morning after hearing that Bessie would be there for lunch at noon. Bessie arrived at 8 o'clock. Glancing behind her, James didn't see Michael and couldn't help but ask, Michael isn't here? His father told him to come home to eat. Bessie pulled off her scarf and lazily sat down on the sofa. Zeke slowly drank his tea and greeted her, feeling relieved that she wasn't affected by the mess on the internet. Jack brought a pot of tea from the kitchen. He paused at the sight of Bessie at the kitchen door, but she didn't notice his strange reaction. She sat on the sofa and rested for a while before entering Tucker's room with her phone. Tucker also heard her coming and had just opened the door and poked his head out. Bessie went in and casually kicked the door shut behind her. She glanced at his computer. No one is teaching you now? Uncle Jack is still looking for someone. Tucker pulled out his chair and sat down. Nodding thoughtfully, Bessie sat beside him and flipped through the books he was reading. Tell me after you finish reading the Foundation books. I'll give you an upgraded version. Tucker nodded. I've almost finished it. Okay. Bessie rubbed her chin and casually thought about the upgraded book. They talked all day long. Zeke and James were already accustomed to this sort of thing. After Bessie had closed the door, Zeke's expression immediately became grave. While sitting at the table, the phone in his hand suddenly rang. 
It was his manager. Have you seen Twitter? The manager was smoking a cigarette, putting the phone to his ear and sneering. Zeke was no longer gentle and calm, and his voice was a little mocking. What do you think? I guess you have, but why bother being angry with a joker? How is Bessie? The manager knew that Zeke would be furious about Sierra's post based on his affection for his niece. Zeke's tone slightly improved at the mention of Bessie. He took out a cigarette and said, She doesn't seem to gossip much and hasn't read Twitter after the show's broadcast. The manager paused, shook his head and laughed. She's so unflappable, she doesn't even care about the reaction of such a popular show. Bessie's reaction wasn't surprising to the manager at all. After all, she was someone who didn't want to open a Twitter account or gain any fans. Ultimately, it's better that the directing team didn't edit it. He consoled Zeke. The director said to endure it until next week. Zeke's public relations team was dealing with the Twitter post from Wish You a Cool Breeze, making sure it didn't blow up too much. Otherwise, it would cause a lot of ripples in the entertainment industry. Zeke reluctantly agreed. Hearing this discussion, Jack squinted his aging eyes and sat down next to Zeke to read the news they were discussing. His face flushed with anger. Why are these people like this? Episode 342 National Top Scorer Hanging up, Zeke stood up, sounding much calmer. This is how it is online. Then we're just letting them be? Jack couldn't suppress his anger. Zeke nodded casually. He was about to turn off his phone and go to Tucker's room when he saw a notification pop up. It was an alert for the most popular recent posts. The top one was Sierra's tweet. Thank you, everyone. She had successfully brought things to the forefront again with this post. Zeke stopped and sat down again. Staring down at this post, he paused for a long time before laughing mockingly. Then, he directly went to his call log and called the director again. Back at Northwestern University, Kara was excited all night and woke up at 9 o'clock. Instead of getting up, she laid on her side under the blanket. Flicking through Zeke's Twitter, she suddenly felt like something was wrong. She followed the clues of all netizens to the hot search. After a while, she found the post from Wish You a Cool Breeze, which listed the three crimes. Frowning, she closed Twitter and called the student union's president. President, who handles the official Twitter? She sat up suddenly scratching her head. The student union's president knew that Kara knew Luke and Bessie and took special care of her. Your department does. What's wrong? There's indeed something wrong. Kara slightly narrowed her eyes. President, I'll tell you in detail later. I have to find our department head first. Because of Mary and the rest of her group, Kara was rather popular in the office now. The office staff didn't ask much after hearing that she wanted to use Northwestern University's official account and simply sent her the account number and password. Kara logged out of her Twitter account and logged into Northwestern University's official Twitter account. From the hot search, she clicked on the Twitter post, Wish You a Cool Breeze. Her three crimes post had already received 70,000 comments and was still on the rise. She had spent all night sorting out her accusations against the production group. She posted a screenshot of Katie's cousin saying that Bessie hadn't even looked up the physics question and also showed a series of similar pictures showing how Bessie couldn't have figured it out under such conditions. After enumerating these, she put a screenshot of the production crew's caption, Fear of Domination by Northwestern University.jpg, on Bessie's head. The screenshot was highly provocative in the three crimes comment area. Her replies to the comments were also full of mockery for Bessie and the crew, Northwestern University school tyrants have expressed their unwillingness to take the blame. What did the Northwestern University school tyrants do wrong to deserve the hate? <laughs> it's my first time seeing someone ruin their own character setup. 
Those who could enter Northwestern University, especially those from the Science and Technology Department, did not have a low IQ. Kara looked through the Twitter post and sneered. She retweeted it with her own comment. Please visit the Northwestern University Forum and find out about the Queen. Bessie is a national top scorer in the final exams. The two biggest universities competed for her. She has done a double major in her first year and every other student is lagging far behind her in each course. Was this also a script given to her? Oh, let me say one more thing. If you bring the physics question to the physics department, we can help you find 10 people who can solve it within 5 seconds. If there was a script, it at least has to be a non-linear structure question. This kind of stupid question also requires a script? Who are you looking down on? Kara used Northwestern University's official Twitter. She didn't check with anyone first. Neither did she need to. Who was Bessie? The first person to enter the Science and Technology Laboratory in December of their freshman year, and not only that, but she also had obtained six black cards, one for each experiment level. She had even helped Northwestern University surpass the University of Chicago by a huge margin, though they had fewer participants in the assessment. But Northwestern University had a confidentiality agreement for that information. Kara only reposted what Wish You a Cool Breeze had written and also slammed her. If it had been President Flores, he would have made her doubt her own life. Northwestern University had more than 3 million followers on their official Twitter. Every day, students from all walks of life visited Northwestern University on Twitter, hoping to be admitted. The 24-hour idol program was also very popular. Thus, many people saw the comment by Northwestern University's Twitter. When they saw that it was Northwestern University's Twitter, most people thought it was fake at first, until they clicked on the homepage. Twitter had officially certified this account with 3 million fans. The onlookers were extremely shocked and read the comment posted by this official Twitter account. What did it mean? The queen? The nation's top scorer? Double major? Hehe, <laughs> Northwestern University is also coming to share the limelight? Some anti-fans started to attack the university as well. What the fuck? She's a national top scorer? The person we couldn't find any information about during the summer holiday? Someone went to find a picture of Bessie in the final exams during the summer vacation. Wait, let me go over to see what Northwestern University's forum is saying. Science Twitter, what's a non-linear box? A non-linear black box. What was that? The onlookers went to research in silence before returning to comment. However, they couldn't find it via the search engines, and most of them only found black box problems. Finally, someone posted an explanation. It's just a problem of judging the capacitance and resistance of diodes, learned in junior high school. It seems like Bessie has a lot of support. Even Northwestern University's official website is here to clear the air. Some people immediately followed suit. Two minutes later, a screenshot was thrown out in the comment area. Non-linear black box problem. It was hard to find on the web, so the screenshots thrown in the comment area had compiled three pictures. The first was of the non-linear black box. Then, the inductance, the non-linear voltage, and a circuit diagram. The most prominent thing was the obvious watermark on the background of these pictures. It said, International Physics Olympiad. The Northwestern University was where all the top students in the country went, and any of them could have been a local champion. Basically, they had participated in national-level competitions in high school on behalf of their provincial and national teams, including the International Physics Olympiad. Kara had also casually written a non-linear box question, which is why she made this comment. This was a question she encountered when she participated in the International Physics Olympiad. She had not thought it was difficult to understand, as she had written it so casually. A group of netizens stared at the screenshot content dumbfounded. That ignorant netizen quickly deleted his comment when it was revealed that it was a junior high school question. At the same time, people who went to check Northwestern University's forum and who went to find the picture of this year's national top scorer also returned.
Hello, everyone. I went to read Northwestern University's forum, and now I've come back crying. I'll show you guys a few posts. Northwestern University's forum was full of posts about Bessie. The link given by this person was a separate post on Bessie's midterm exams. Below were also screenshots of Bessie's answer sheet taken by two graduate students who had revised her paper. The test questions for the various examinations could also be seen above. Netizens who were college students studying advanced mathematics and physics read these questions and went crazy. This is insane. After reading Northwestern University's questions, I actually think that the physics question set by the production crew is child's play. Someone pinch me. Plus one. Plus ID number. She can get full marks for this kind of paper, and she even handed in her paper in advance? To tell the truth, I'm a sophomore studying mathematics, but I don't even understand what she wrote on the last question. Ah, I found the top scorer in this year's national exam. The person who won second place in the cultural sciences by over 10 points. Picture attached. It turns out that she's the top scorer who made me doubt if I should change majors. Sorry, let me slap myself in the face. Go search this year's national top scorer, then search for the difficulty of the test paper before commenting again. After posting on Twitter and watching the sharp rise in the comments and likes, Kara logged out, then got up from her bed. She went to brush her teeth and then called the student union's president. She informed him about the official Twitter post. It was Sunday and the student union's president was in the library. It's okay, I won't delete it, he assured her. On the call with Kara, he was surprised to hear about Bessie's situation. Instead of going to the library, he opened the official Twitter account and went to read the post. Northwestern University's students naturally had a sense of collective honor. Their own schoolmate was being bullied outside the school, and they were also slandering the school. Unlike many others, the student union's president was familiar with Jerome and knew about Bessie's feet in the laboratory. He also switched to Northwestern University's student union's official Twitter and retweeted the post from Wish You a Cool Breeze. He then tagged some of the top students of the student union. Many students of Northwestern University also had Twitter and had watched the program previously. They had only discovered last night that Bessie was on the show. When this Twitter incident broke out, the pictures of people ridiculing Northwestern University's school nerds also aroused their anger, especially the students of the Science and Technology Department. Among these people, some were top students who were influential on Twitter. Northwestern University's sophomores, juniors, and double majors all commented one by one. I'm from the Science and Technology Department. My second major is Archaeology, but it's only today that I discovered that being from the Science and Technology Department means that I can't study Archaeology. Can't I have other interests other than STEM? Smiley face. Chemistry Department, student number 201, minor in law and economics. I've gotten all my master's degrees. Sorry, I'm holding everyone back. I'm a scum from the medical department, and I only minor in a foreign language. Several students had been officially verified on Twitter, and comments from them sprang up like weeds. A well-known blogger revealed that the science and technology department's king had obtained a bachelor's degree in law in his sophomore year. Episode 343, A Review of the Program One wave after another, Northwestern University's school nerds aimed at the second point of the three crimes post that suggested the science and technology department students couldn't know about the Babylonian literature. The onlookers started doubting their convictions. Most netizens lived on their mobile phones every day. Naturally, it was difficult to imagine the life of those really hard-working school nerds. This time, because of the netizens and wish you a cool breeze, the school nerds all came out one by one to educate the netizens. Degree certificates, medals, experimental records... They dazzled people and left them dumbfounded. Queen. Final exam top scorer? Northwestern University school nerd. Very quickly swept the entire network. As for the character set up for Bessie, 
At this moment, no one really believed that the production crew would give Bessie such a simple question and ask her to recite the lines in advance. Now that things had developed to this point, it was clear at a glance that the production crew hadn't given her a character set up. Netizens also realized that compared to what Bessie did in Northwestern University, those things on the program were really nothing. As for the Babylonian literature that Wish You a Cool Breeze specifically listed, a sophomore in the Science and Technology Department posted their archaeological papers that were collected by the state, and no one dared to refute them. How could they? What could they say? All the three crimes tweet posted by Wish You a Cool Breeze was still pinned on her Twitter homepage. After the appearance of the real Northwestern University school nerds, her three crimes seemed extremely ridiculous. The sentence, the people from Northwestern University I know aren't like that, was especially singled out and commented on. Blogger, that's because the Northwestern University school nerds you know are fake. When Zeke's manager saw Sierra's tweet, he came to the Park Place apartments to find Zeke. Over this period, the manager also understood how much Zeke valued Bessie and took care of every aspect of her well-being. He had already taken all of these into account before the show was aired and hadn't slept all night. Wish you a cool breeze and Sierra's movements must have heavily affected him. After entering the apartment and realizing that Zeke was still there, the manager heaved a sigh of relief. Zeke was discussing things over the phone with the production crew. The director also hadn't expected Sierra to suddenly come out to steal the limelight. Her Twitter post had insinuated that the production crew was shady. Broadcast the second episode ahead of schedule. Zeke leaned back in his chair, his words sounding rather simple. But it made everyone's heart leap in trepidation. The director on the other end of the phone took in this command while smoking a cigarette. In fact, as long as he broadcast the second episode... All rumors on the internet would be wiped out. Bessie would quickly attract fans, and that would make up for the first episode. Once that happened, all these negative comments would be nothing. Because of the second episode, her rate of attracting fans would be terrifying, and the director felt like even Zeke and Noah couldn't compare. No matter how impressive the production crew was, could they possibly invite Toby and Noah to help shoot Bessie to fame? The problem was, the second episode being broadcast in advance was unprecedented. The major TV networks wouldn't want to cooperate with these arrangements. It had to be broadcast online and on the networks on next Saturday at 8 o'clock. After all, what about the other popular TV programs? No matter how impressive the program was, they didn't dare compete with provincial TV stations. And the schedule was created by the TV stations. Zeke, I'm still discussing this with President Soup. I'm a director and can't decide this. If you convince President Soup and open up the relationship between all levels of the TV stations and networks and get them to agree, I can even release it immediately. The director was about to cry. Zeke irritably took out a cigarette and dialed Robert's phone number. He had decided to call him directly. The director said that this episode was broadcast under Robert's instruction. Zeke also wanted to know whether Robert was deliberately targeting Bessie. Once the phone was connected, Robert's polite voice sounded, Mr. Miller, hello. Even on the phone, Robert's respectful attitude was evident. Zeke was taken aback again. Robert's attitude was completely different from what he had imagined. It didn't sound like he had meant for the production to release an episode targeting Bessie. Zeke talked to him about letting the production crew broadcast the second episode ahead of schedule, and also talked about the public opinion on the internet. As it was regarding Bessie, Robert immediately went downstairs. He narrowed his eyes, his tone solemn. Okay, I'll contact the TV station and ask for things to be broadcast in advance. They hung up. Zeke hadn't expected things to go so smoothly, especially not Robert's last sentence about contacting the TV station. Could the Soup family influence the major TV stations so easily? Zeke squinted his eyes thoughtfully. With Robert's help, this matter would probably be quickly resolved. He slowly let out a sigh of relief. 
he turned around and told the manager, Notify the public relations team. The second episode will be broadcast in advance. Prepare the content of the notice. The manager continued standing, lowered his head, and took out his phone again. He called the studio and then put the phone to his ear. Frowning, Jack put down his phone and then asked Zeke and his manager anxiously, How should we deal with this matter? Uh, it's hard to find evidence. I can only think that we should wait for the popularity to fade. If it weren't for Zeke's words, even Jack wouldn't have believed Bessie's performance on the show. So how could the audience believe it? Zeke rubbed his temples and glanced at Tucker's closed door. It'll be better when the second episode comes out. He glanced at the manager. The manager dialed a number, but before he could speak, the studio's public relations department agitatedly interrupted him. Why didn't you say that your niece is the top scorer of the final examination? Why did we have to prepare the draft overnight? We've been so busy, but Northwestern University just resolved it in one sentence. Without waiting for the manager's reply, the public relations department rattled on like a machine gun. It's fine now. I haven't even finished reading all the tweets of the Northwestern University School nerds. He hung up with a pop, forgetting that the manager was his superior in his excitement. Zeke, wait. The manager raised his hand, surprised by the phrase, Top student in the final exams? And then opened Twitter. It seems like the program group doesn't need to update the second episode in advance. The manager directly went to the hot search bar. The top three posts on the hot search all had an explosive number of hits. Northwestern University Queen. Final exam top scorer, Bessie Miller. Northwestern University's official Twitter. The manager didn't read the first hot search. He clicked directly onto the second hot search that included Bessie's name. The second most popular tweet under the topic was a post by an entertainment blogger. I didn't know it previously, and only when I checked on it did I realize just how terrifying this year's college entrance examination top scorer is. Be it Devenhoff's mathematics paper or combined sciences, candidates should remember that there was this person who arrogantly obtained all full marks. Picture, picture, picture. The first picture was of Bessie's final exam results. The second was of the nation's average score. The third was of a Twitter post from June discussing the top scorer. The manager stared at the pictures in a daze without going to the comments. Thinking of what the public relations staff had said, he continued reading the first and third hot searches. Northwestern University Queen. That trend was full of Bessie's feats at Northwestern University. Northwestern University school nerds were also posting their degree certificates. What on earth is going on? Jack was extremely anxious. Gaping, the manager took a deep breath, looked at Zeke for a long while, and finally relaxed a bit. Zeke, the notice draft is unnecessary, and the episode doesn't have to be broadcast in advance anymore. This matter seems to be resolved, but it's still trending. Your niece, just look at Twitter. Without the need for probing, Zeke had already taken out his cell phone. Upon hearing this, Jack also took his phone out and flipped through Twitter. In the kitchen, James had been busy cooking. He came out to get some green onions. He saw the three people standing at the table, frozen in place. James picked up the green onion and waved to the manager. Stay for lunch. Do you eat spicy food? The manager nodded without paying much attention. James immediately started preparing for another dish, looking very happy. Mr. Miller, regaining his sanity after a few minutes, the manager turned to look quietly at James. Your daughter is the final exam's top scorer? James smiled after hearing this and didn't seem surprised at all. Yeah, why? Fairfield's mayor even gave us $10,000 as scholarship money this year. She even got admitted to Northwestern University. The manager was speechless. He couldn't bring himself to look at James's thick face. Were the $10,000 and Northwestern University important now? Yes, fine, she was from Northwestern University, but shouldn't the fact that she was the final exam top scorer be the first thing he mentioned? With trembling fingers holding his phone, Jack also looked up at James in shock, his mouth hanging agape. 
He had some eye trouble, but he could clearly read the Twitter posts. He had originally thought that the most intelligent of the Miller family's direct descendants in his lifetime would be Tucker, who was talented with computers. But after reading these posts, he realized that the Miller family's most intelligent person was Bessie, who was studying in Northwestern University's Science and Technology Department. If she was willing, according to how things were developing, it was only a matter of time before she entered the research institute. James was completely ignorant of their feelings now and only suddenly straightened his body gravely. Shit, I totally forgot to add herbs to the soup. Disregarding them completely, he grabbed the herbs and immediately ran back to the kitchen to add them to the soup. Staring at his back, Jack finally understood why Zeke and James had been so calm about Bessie not having a character set up. After a long while, the manager turned to Zeke. Are you okay? He asked. Episode 344, 24-Hour Idol Zeke was naturally not okay. Fiddling with his phone, he managed to mutter, Yeah. After logging into his own account, he liked the posts from Northwestern University's official Twitter and all the school nerds. His fans immediately noticed these likes. Having done this, he suddenly thought of something. Flipping to Sierra's Twitter, he coldly smirked. Handle Sierra. Katie and Zeke hadn't been petty with her over her antics on the show, but after their return, her contract had been terminated and her work affected. But now, she was actually bold enough to not only ride on the waves of the show, but also directly step on Bessie. This point triggered Zeke. On Sierra's side, once her tweet had posted, her popularity increased sharply. In the beginning, everyone was comforting her. Half an hour later, she realized that the comments started becoming strange. The commentary style changed completely. Her post had said, Thank you, everyone. Guessing that the production crew had forced her to comply with Bessie's character setup, most people had felt sorry for her grievances. But now, they were furious at being fooled. Sierra watched as her following decreased continuously and then went to the hot search. She started panicking. At this time, her phone rang furiously. She picked up immediately. Her manager started yelling at her. Didn't I tell you to ride the waves and take only a slice of the pie? Do you think Zeke and the production crew are so easy to be trifled with? It's fine if you want to meet your own downfall, but why are you dragging us along? The netizens are still cursing you out. Zeke Miller and the Soup Corporation are still waiting to have their turn. We're finished. Now it's done. You've achieved your goals. You're famous. You've successfully become famous. Are you satisfied? The Soup Corporation didn't originally have a dispute with Sierra. After all, it was the Soup Corporation staff member's mistake. But now, Sierra had made it impossible for them to ignore her. Even if there had been 100 of her, she wouldn't have been able to deal with just Zeke, let alone the Soup Corporation. Sierra's manager hung up weekly. Notifications popped up. Zeke's likes had already spread in the industry. The few people whom the manager had uneasily made connections with in the past few days all blocked him. He could only keep his tail tucked in from now on and wait for the opportunity to return once the news cycle was over. As for the 24-hour idol production crew, they were all in a meeting. The director had just received a notice that the Soup Corporation was aware of the incident on Twitter and could arrange to release the second episode in advance. Twitter was still abuzz with comments like, No wonder the whole team is rethinking their lives. It turns out she's the final exam's top scorer, Northwestern University's queen. The publicity head closed Twitter and glanced at the director. This is the second episode broadcasting in advance. Taking a leisurely sip of his tea, the director smiled. In advance? No, it definitely won't be broadcast in advance. The publicity team nodded in agreement, but President Soup actually settled the TV station so quickly. Zeke's niece, someone quietly said. 
The production crew exchanged glances. Just now, the major TV station heads had directly called to discuss this matter, and it was obvious whose influence it was due to. I'll see if the second episode has any problems. The publicity head got up and went out to re-watch the second episode from beginning to end and confirm that nothing was wrong. Inside the Clark family house, Michael was still holding his phone tightly, slowly flipping through Twitter. Sitting in the middle of the room, Joshua's expression was grave as a subordinate reported the situation, sitting straight as a rod. Only Michael sat casually, leaning on the pillow behind his back while lazily playing with his phone. Ten minutes ago, he had even gone out to take a phone call. Joshua had pretended not to notice. However, Aaron and the others were blind with rage, but dared not speak. Michael was at the apex of his power in the Clark family. The security guard who came back from Hawaii was now powerful enough to directly challenge Aaron. Everyone in the Clark family now knew how loyal and respectful the security guard was to Michael. After the meeting and his meal, Michael walked out with his phone. Behind him, Aaron's eyes darkened, and he turned to the person beside him. Any response from Captain Baldwin's side? Captain Baldwin was a famous name in the Clark family's base in Evanston. He had returned to the headquarters two months ago and in just a short period managed to climb to the top position and accumulate significant power. Other than a few neutral security guards, the security guard from Hawaii and the others now had the capacity to threaten Aaron. Aaron couldn't sit still. Previously, he had tried to reel Captain Baldwin in subtly, step by step, but now he was doing it openly. Captain Baldwin's side hasn't responded yet. He's only focused on bringing his men to training. He's being as indifferent as the other security guard. His subordinate responded, teasing Joshua's parrot with his fingers. Aaron frowned slightly and said in a grave voice, Continue working on him. It was even better if Captain Baldwin had a stubborn personality. At least he wouldn't be reeled in by Michael. Furthermore, even if Aaron couldn't reel him in, he could still make his presence known to him. When the Clark family held a vote next time, even if Captain Baldwin was neutral, he might still cast his vote for Aaron. Thinking of this, Aaron slightly heaved a sigh of relief. Instead of returning to the Highline Apartments, Michael drove to the Park Place Apartments and waited across the street. He looked down at the message on his phone from Bessie, telling him not to come upstairs. Casually throwing the phone on the seat beside him, he put his hands on the steering wheel and leaned back in his seat. He squinted at James's building with clear eyes, his expression cold. James's door opened and Zeke and James came out with Bessie to send her off. Why don't you stay for dinner? James nagged and looked up at the car parked across the street. Michael is here to pick you up. Why don't you let him come in and sit for a while? He was about to go over to greet Michael. However, Bessie put on her scarf and reached out to grab his sleeve. She looked up, her face expressionless. He's down with a bad cold. It's not convenient. James nodded and didn't go over. He nagged at her to take care of herself and dress warmly. Then he let her leave. Standing aside silently, Zeke and Jack naturally understood that Bessie didn't want them to see Michael. Zeke stared at the black car. He couldn't see the person in the driver's seat through the darkened window. He only saw the cold light reflected from the cufflinks on his wrist. The black car slowly drove over, and James suddenly thought of something. Michael has a cold, but why is Bessie with him? What if she catches it as well? He immediately took out his phone to call Michael. Zeke glanced at him. He noticed James had saved the name as Michael. He stayed behind with Jack as James went upstairs. Even after Michael's car disappeared from view, Jack was still staring in the direction. If only James's father was still alive and Miss Miller had grown up in the Miller family. She had developed into such a genius even while wandering far from home. If the Miller family had cultivated her with its former glory, how different would the situation be now? Jack was now full of enthusiasm. 
Tucker had inherited the Miller family's computing talent, while Bessie had inherited her grandfather's intelligence. After so many years, finally, someone in the Miller family had the talent to enter the research institute. Don't intervene in Bessie's matters in the future. Zeke looked away and glanced at Jack, his voice strict. Don't burden her with the Miller family matters. Sighing, Jack chuckled. Zeke, you're thinking too much. They had already fallen from grace and didn't even have control of the research institute anymore. The only thing in their hands were some projects in the IT department. So how could they possibly bring the research institute matters in front of Bessie? The two stayed in the cold breeze for a while before Jack finally remembered Tucker's matter from the previous night. Any news on Tucker's teacher? That weekend, the Northwestern University school nerds blew up Twitter. The two moments from the show, fear of being dominated by Northwestern University school tyrants dot GIF, and who doesn't have a second degree dot GIF, were all the rage on the internet for the whole weekend. Everyone rewatched 24 Hour Idol several times. Some netizens even discovered a few new highlights. Ha ha ha, why didn't I notice this before? When Bessie came out of the house, the director even sounded so weak. Yes, yes, also, after she calculated the hexadecimal, the production crew's voices became stiff. Stupid director, what kind of 24 hour idol show is this? Can't you see how bright the sky is? I think it's more like 8 hour idol. It was called 24-Hour Idol because it would usually record from morning to night. The production crew's setup was perverse and difficult, so they could normally record until about 10 p.m. But now, they finished so early. The netizens slapped their tables in laughter. Some people even went to the program's official Twitter and told them to change their name to 8-Hour Idol. They made comments like, What rights do you have to be so arrogant? More and more people tagged the official Twitter of the show, begging for Bessie's Twitter handle. It was at the top of the hot search as they begged the production crew to respond. Finally sensing a chance to retaliate after being mocked, the official Twitter replied coldly, She has none. What comes around goes around. The netizens urged for the second episode to be released with tears. Boo-hoo, I look forward to the friends invited by the goddess Bessie. Will she invite someone from Northwestern University's student union? The stupid production crew has their lips sealed so tightly. I hope you guys collectively explode. Episode 345. Blame her for being too irritating. Bessie wasn't bothered about what happened online and was busy finding the new version of the book she had promised Tucker. On Monday, she went to school early in the morning. After class in the afternoon, she took out her phone to see that Caleb had yet to add her on Twitter. Resting her chin in her hand, she thought about whether she should hack his contact information and then call him. At this time, she received another friend request. She opened it to see the message. Hello, I'm Mr. Rostron's student assistant in the laboratory. Bessie added this person. They didn't send any further messages. She casually put away her phone and went to the library. At 3 p.m., she finally received a message from the student assistant. The laboratory is on the third basement floor, B317. Come here first. The message was concise and clear. Bessie packed up her books and went to the laboratory with her backpack. The laboratory was on the third floor underground, in room B317. Bessie walked to the door and saw a tall woman wearing protective clothing, holding experimental equipment in her hands. She noticed Bessie, hesitated for a while, and then lowered her voice. Are you the new student assigned to Mr. Rostron's laboratory this year? Few new members in the laboratory were girls, so to a year was already considered good. This new member was a girl, and she was even pretty. Nodding, Bessie said calmly, Hello, my name is Bessie Miller. She was quite polite. Yes, my name is Sarah May. I'm now Mr. Rostron's student assistant. The tall woman looked away and then stepped outside the lab. Follow me to change your clothes first. Mr. Rostron is very busy at the moment and doesn't have time to meet you. I'll first familiarize you with the laboratory this week. 
Bessie followed her to the changing room and put on a set of protective clothing. Then, she followed Sarah into the laboratory. The laboratory was large and long, with a lot of precision instruments. Records of experiments filled the surrounding shelves, and some engineering research materials were also randomly placed on a few shelves. These materials were written by professors and researchers, and some were from research done in the hospital. The entire laboratory was divided into three sections by glass walls. Bessie and Sarah stood in the outermost area. Inside the inner areas, two figures stood, their faces unclear. Sarah took out a handbook from the shelf at the entrance and gave it to Bessie. This is the basic manual used by your laboratory. If you have a free moment, remember to check it out. Our laboratory has a total of three students. The one inside is Elijah. Sarah pointed to him, then continued. Mr. Rostron is doing very important research. You can move around in the two outer areas, but don't randomly touch things. And don't disturb Mr. Rostron in the innermost room. Looking down and flipping through the manual with her delicate eyebrows lowered, Bessie calmly answered, Okay, Sarah glanced at her, and then went in and passed the equipment in her hand to Mr. Rostron. Mr. Rostron was looking at the data displayed on the screen in front of him, frowning. Mr. Rostron, the new student is outside, Sarah said. Nodding, Mr. Rostron remained silent and didn't even turn to look. He was originally from the research institute, not the laboratory. In the research institute, he rarely brought new students because it was too troublesome. He only had two students, Sarah and Elijah. The experimental process had always been slow. Major laboratories already had micro-reactor experimental equipment from the research institute. As long as students could control the current and the number of reactions, they could make a microfusion reaction as well as energy testing equipment. However, the reaction had too many variables. He had discussed with other scholars more than once in the research institute, and so far, he still had yet to find the material that could replace the magnetic field and laser to control the reaction process. The laboratory had a reactor underground that had been left by a researcher at the research institute 20 years ago. A layer of unknown metal laid outside the reactor. So far, no one in the research institute had identified the metal material. Mr. Rostron looked at the data and returned to the experimental bench behind him. Elijah, increase the magnetic field. He stared at the micronuclear fusion happening under the glass cover. Elijah walked to the other side and pressed the button on the instrument, increasing the current and controlling the magnetic field. Seeing Mr. Rostron's behavior, Sarah didn't mention the new student further. Give me the data from yesterday's experiment. Mr. Rostron watched the reaction, pushing his glasses up and speaking in a serious tone. Sarah thought for a while and walked outside to get the data. After reading the laboratory manual, Bessie strolled around the outermost area. What she focused on was the engineering research and laboratory materials on the shelves. Bessie, coming from inside, Sarah glanced up at her as she flipped through the shelf. Find the records of yesterday's experiment, print them out and bring them over. It's on the computer behind you. After speaking, she turned and went back in. Bessie stopped flipping through the book. She glanced behind her. An LCD computer was placed in the corner of the room, still turned on, and the screen densely displayed many documents. The documents were marked with a date and serial number. Bessie took a look and found yesterday's data record on the screen. She scanned the cumbersome data and disorderly tables. Then she pulled out a chair and sat down. She tidied up the form, reordering the experimental records and conclusions. Ten minutes later, she clicked the button to print the documents. Checking that there was no problem, she directly walked to the laboratory on the innermost floor. Instead of entering, she just stood at the glass door. She knocked on it with her fingers, but the sound wasn't loud. When Sarah saw her, she came out and walked straight to the computer. Is there something you don't understand about the data record? She asked. The daily data records were messy and cumbersome. Previously, she and Elijah had taken turns collating them, and most of the content was brought over from the research institute. 
Seeing Bessie approach her, her first reaction was naturally that Bessie didn't understand something. No. Bessie handed the printed documents to her and slowly said, It's printed. Huh? Sarah was taken aback. So fast? Looking down, she opened the experimental records and flipped through them. The records on it were orderly and carefully sorted out without any obvious mistakes. Sarah took the experimental records and handed them to Mr. Rostrin. Then, she came back and took out another form and handed it to Bessie in a hurry. Calculate this, she said before returning to the inner room. Bessie took a look at it. With one hand in her pocket, she stood outside and looked at the three people inside for a while. Then, she went back out to the outermost area, picked up the book on the shelf, and read it for half an hour. Only then did she open the software on the computer. She typed a string of code and then looked at the results displayed. She wrote down the messy and cumbersome data before showing it to Sarah, who didn't say anything since she had taken a normal amount of time. Pulling out the stool in front of the computer, Bessie sat down, crossed her legs, and put the book on her lap. She leaned back and slowly read it. Under the incandescent lamp, her eyes were like cold jade. When Elijah took his cup to the drinking fountain outside to get water, he saw the newcomer flipping through the book and was taken aback. This kind of beauty was indeed rare in the laboratory. He stared at her as she turned over the logs of the science and technology department. Elijah introduced himself. You must be the new assistant here. She greeted him and continued to look at the logs. Her eyes were cold. This new assistant was a little cool. Elijah filled up his cup and stood by the water dispenser, drinking water while watching Bessie. Then, he walked to the shelf beside him, found a book, and walked towards Mr. Rostrin while flipping through it. After turning to the research page that Mr. Rostrin needed, he looked outside again. Bessie was still sitting on the chair and calmly flipping through the book as if she hadn't just entered the laboratory and wasn't a terrified, ignorant newcomer. When Bessie was halfway through the book, her phone buzzed. She picked it up from the table and glanced at it. It was a message from Michael. He asked her when she was getting out of class. She glanced at the time. It was 5.30. She clicked on the chat and slowly typed a response. I'm in the laboratory. I don't know when they'll finish their experiments. She hadn't even seen Mr. Rostron's face yet. After sending this sentence, she threw her phone back onto the table and continued flipping through the logs. The logs recorded all kinds of events from the time the laboratory was established to the present day. The one Bessie was flipping through was updated through last year. What happened 20 years ago was vaguely breezed past. She spent nearly two hours reading the book from beginning to end. Closing it, she stood up with her hands on the table and leaned on it. Checking the time, it was 7 p.m. She put the book back on the shelf. When she turned around, Mr. Rostron and the others had come out. Without taking off his protective clothing, Mr. Rostron put on his gold-rimmed glasses and looked at her. You. He had focused on the experiment and hadn't paid attention when Sarah talked to him. Sarah reminded him. Mr. Rostron, this is the new student, Bessie. Oh, yes, Bessie. He nodded. If there's anything you don't understand in the future, you can check the information from both sides or ask one of them. Otherwise, you can shout for me. After that, he went outside. Bessie, we're going to eat. Sarah took off her protective clothing and turned to Bessie. You can tidy up the things in the laboratory and leave whenever you're done. Crossing her arms... Bessie stood for a while in the laboratory, thinking. Then, she walked over to one of the tables, annoyed. Her hands had just touched the voltmeter when it was snatched away by someone. Episode 346 The Release of the First Episode Mr. Rostron, who had turned back to pick things up, took the voltmeter from her. He frowned and spoke in a tight voice. What are you doing? Bessie looked back at him. She pinched her fingers tightly. Because of her pale skin, the blood vessels were very obvious. Outside, Sarah appeared wearing regular clothes and a black coat. She came in and quickly said, Mr. Rostron, I asked her to clean up the laboratory. 
She won't need to clean up the experiments here in the future. Mr. Rostron looked away blankly. He was antisocial, and the content of his research was all secrets of the Research Institute. Neither he, nor Sarah and Elijah, had expected there to be a new student. Sarah nodded. Mr. Rostron had strict schedules, and he was as rigorous as a robot. He raised his hand to check the time before going out for dinner. Sarah and Elijah quickly followed. Pausing, Elijah turned around to comfort Bessie. You just entered the laboratory and don't understand a lot of things. Mr. Rostron's personality is like that. When I first came here, the research he was doing was also very important, and many things were forbidden to me. You should finish memorizing the manual first, then familiarize yourself with the laboratory. You'll be more accustomed to things in a month or so. Bessie expressionlessly walked out with her scarf on. Outside of the laboratory's gate, Michael's car was parked not far away. He had probably been standing outside for a while and was now sitting against the front of the car, his figure long and slender. He leaned one hand on the car and held his phone with the other. The laboratory was a restricted area and not many people came and went. Noticing someone coming out, he looked up and saw that it was Bessie. The streetlight outside was dim and her expression couldn't be seen clearly. However, she looked to be in low spirits. Raising an eyebrow, he stood up, waiting for her to approach him before embracing her. Something happened? He only knew today that she had entered the laboratory. He had been to the laboratory before as well, but his situation had been different at that time. The entire medical laboratory belonged to the Clark family, so the laboratory had been under his control. However, Bessie's situation was different. He calmly thought of Mr. Rostron, whom she had mentioned to him before. Narrowing his eyes, he reminded himself to get people to look into him. Nothing. Bessie pulled him down to her and rested her head on his shoulder. After calming down for about five minutes, she raised her head. Let's go home. Rosemary and Joshua were both in the Highline apartments. The chef had prepared a meal for Bessie, but she didn't return at the usual time. Marvin told Joshua and Rosemary to go ahead and eat, but they didn't want to. It wasn't until 7.30 that Bessie came back to start the meal. Bessie, did you go to the laboratory today? Asked Rosemary as she picked up her fork. Michael looked up, glanced at her, and said in an emotionless voice, She didn't. Didn't I mention it to you an hour ago? Rosemary resisted the urge to roll her eyes at him. No, I wanted to know which teacher she was with. She glanced at Bessie again, smiling, showing kindness on her graceful face. This time as well, it was Michael who slowly replied to her, Mr. Rostron, a special teacher in the Research Institute. Any other questions? Rosemary was speechless. Was she asking him? She reminded herself about the deficit several times. Oh, a special grade teacher. Joshua also looked up in surprise and thought for a while. Northwestern Memorial Hospital has only six special researchers, so you're lucky to meet one of them. Simons then reminded him, Mr. Clark, there are only five special researchers in Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Wasn't it six? Taken aback, Joshua suddenly remembered something and nodded. He turned to Bessie again, his eyebrows slightly raised. Bessie, perform well. That Mr. Rostron will definitely accept you as a student. Generally, special researchers didn't casually accept students. They controlled part of the confidential content. But at this time, Simons didn't dare to remind Joshua of this. After all, he also felt that given Bessie's qualifications, he wouldn't be surprised if she was accepted as a student by a special researcher. Gripping his fork and looking up, Michael indifferently stared at Joshua. Dad, is the food not delicious? Joshua was stunned. It's delicious. Michael looked away and lazily said, Good. Everyone except Marvin got the hint. They realized that Michael was chiding Joshua for talking too much. 
Nobody dared to speak after that, and the chef who collected the bowls didn't even dare to look at Michael. Bessie! After the meal, Joshua stayed behind and sat down opposite Bessie with a cup of tea. Hugging a pillow, Bessie rested her head on it and took out her phone to open Twitter. She looked up at him with clear eyes. Joshua lowered his head to take a sip of the tea, coughing slightly. You've finished your assessment. Are you still busy? Not really. Bessie changed her posture. Joshua nodded. He fell silent again. Beside him, Simon's lip twitched, and he turned to Rosemary, who had gone downstairs to watch Marvin's big screen and was just walking back upstairs now. Miss, the clothes you ordered have been sent to the old house. Hearing this, she narrowed her eyes. What clothes? The clothes you'll wear on your father's birthday next week. Simons respectfully replied. Rosemary calmly looked away. I understand. Dad, I've already prepared a gift, but you can tell me what you want in advance. Joshua waved his hand as if he didn't care too much. Why would you prepare a gift? It's just another birthday, not a big celebration. It's unnecessary. Casually opening Mr. Cheatham's profile, Bessie heard this and looked up. Bessie, a few people will come on that day, as well as a security guard you're familiar with. Rosemary walked towards her laughing. We're all a family. Do you want to come and celebrate with us? Our house still has many rooms. Squinting, Bessie was deep in thought. She didn't respond for a while. Joshua pretended to calmly drink tea. After about two minutes, she looked up, her eyes clear. I'll see how busy I am. She didn't agree nor refuse, so it was still negotiable. Good. This was much better than Joshua had expected. After all, he had invited her during the festival before, but she had refused without hesitation. After sitting for a while with the teacup in his hand, he left with his hands behind his back. Bessie was still sitting on the sofa typing a message to send to Mr. Cheatham. Is the black book on your shelf still there? The account labeled neighbor replied with question marks. Squinting, Bessie thought for a while, then typed another message. Chicago, computer store, the sixth book on the fourth floor of the second column of the bookshelf. After a few minutes, he replied with two messages. I've told you many times, it's not called a black book. That's the Hacker Alliance's programming book. Bessie squinted at the last line and was silent for a moment. It was indeed a black book with a black cover and a few stiff white horizontal and vertical lines as decoration. A few irregular white letters were also written. But it was black. According to Mr. Cheatham, it was an impressive cover that some hackers had specially developed. It seriously was the Hacker Alliance's programming book. She typed another message. Do you still have it? On the other end of the conversation, Mr. Cheatham pushed his glasses up and blankly typed a message. It's still in Fairfield, but I can get you a new one in a few days. A few days and it was finally Friday. Bessie's schedule was packed. After class, she received a message from Principal White. She thought for a while and thought that he must want to explain the experimental task assigned to her. She took her backpack and went to see him. At the same time, in Laboratory B317, Elijah hurriedly walked in with a bunch of documents. The new student sorted out the data very quickly yesterday. He handed the documents to Mr. Rostron and suddenly thought of something. Have you seen her today? He asked Sarah. Putting away the transformer she was working with and returning to read her papers, Sarah just looked up, glanced outside, and shook her head, not caring too much. Maybe she can't accept the gap between us. Those in Northwestern University's science and technology department weren't ordinary, especially those who could pass the laboratory test. They were considered geniuses. But who wasn't a genius in the laboratory? Here, apart from the formal researchers, who had the capacity to be arrogant? Every year, a certain number of people passed the laboratory test, but only a few could enter the research institute. The mentors and professors were used to this and naturally wouldn't coddle the new students like the outside world. 
It was normal that those proud children couldn't stand being ignored for the first time by their instructors and would stop coming. After several blows of neglect, they would come obediently. Hearing Sarah's words while flipping through his book, Mr. Rostron frowned lightly. He continued doing his experiment. I'm going to work on my paper. Sarah was carefully continuing to revise the paper she planned to submit to SCI. She was a member of Mr. Rostron's laboratory, and everyone in the laboratory, including her, wanted to become his student. Elijah had published three papers. Sarah had just published a paper and was researching other projects in the same area during this time. In a private restaurant near Northwestern University, Bessie sat face to face with Principal White. Research about this. Principal White handed her a document. She put down her fork and took a look. It was a slightly complicated research material on a computer science subject. Every year, the laboratory recommends candidates for the research institute. Principal White ate a piece of food before slowly speaking. Luke took his private team abroad to participate in a research project at the end of September and is now in the research institute. From freshman year to now, 10 research topics have been published on SCI and they have been jointly promoted to the research institute. Those students are now in the third level. Principal White looked at Bessie. He particularly emphasized the 10 SCI research papers, dragging out the words, he was giving heavy hints. Bessie closed the document. Her reply was slow. Episode 347, The Comment Session I got it. Reaching out to pull over her backpack, she put the research document inside. Luke wrote the paper very diligently, said Principal White as he picked up a spoonful of vegetables. Casually throwing her backpack aside, Bessie glanced at him and calmly said, He's very diligent in law studies as well. I heard he's been looking for a professor to mentor him. Luke was good at everything. He also set aside one day every week to study the law and didn't even go to the laboratory. Because of his achievements in science, his teacher tried to earnestly exhort him, but still failed to persuade him. The teacher couldn't beat or scold him, so he finally found a law professor for him. Principal White paused and then kindly said, Of course, the experimental projects are more important. SCI papers and the likes can be done slowly. There's no rush. Bessie looked away from him and continued eating, with her legs crossed. The two finished their meal. It was already six in the evening, she didn't walk out with Principal White, but saw Michael's car parked by the road immediately. It wasn't Michael in the driver's seat, but Patrick instead. She opened the door of the back seat and got in. Michael was still reading a document when she got in. He closed the folder and put it aside. Leaning over casually, his eyes were clear and his tone was casual. Have you eaten? Yeah. Bessie put her backpack casually on her lap. In the driver's seat, Patrick glanced at the rearview mirror and respectfully asked, Miss Miller, should we go back to the Highline Apartments or the Experimental? He suddenly paused. A few days ago, Michael had asked him to check on Mr. Rostron, so he knew he was a special researcher in the Research Institute. Having checked on his information, he found that they were first-level encrypted. Without 129's help, he couldn't do much more than check on his general character. Most of what he was asked to search was about Bessie. Recently, Michael didn't even let others mention the laboratory. Patrick paused mid-sentence. Resting her chin in her hand, Bessie glanced at him and casually smiled. Ever since Monday night, she had been in a bad mood and was a little impatient. Fortunately, she had calmed down after returning to the Highline Apartments. But Michael kept it in mind. He had reacted very strongly, especially when Joshua spoke. Bessie leaned against the door and chuckled. She really didn't care about the things in the laboratory. 
Rosemary, Joshua, Dean Soup, and the others all hoped she could find a good teacher in the laboratory and that it was best to achieve an apprenticeship to Mr. Rostrin because Mr. Rostrin was one of the five special research fellows in the Research Institute. But they didn't know that Bessie had not gone to the laboratory to find a teacher. She had already been apprenticed by Principal White. She had gone to the laboratory to do projects and research. According to Principal White, he wanted her to participate in international project research like Luke. Of course, it would be even better if she could write a few professional SCI papers and add more academic content to the laboratory. Ten minutes later, the car arrived at the parking lot. They got out of the car and headed upstairs. Patrick parked the car and followed them up with the car keys. Upstairs, Marvin was having a video call with Mary's father, asking him if the flowers and leaves would wilt every winter and discussing if there was a problem with his cultivation method. When Bessie and Michael came in, he said goodbye to Mary's father and hung up. On the other end of the phone, Mary's father turned to look at Mary, who was holding an economics book, and sighed at Mary's mother. Marvin is a really good gardener. On the other end of the phone, Marvin hung up and went to retrieve a package from the side of the door. He handed it to Bessie. Miss Miller, your package. Bessie took off her coat and scarf and put them aside. She checked the date and guessed that this express package was probably Mr. Cheatham's black book. So she didn't open it and prepared to directly send it to Tucker. She received a cup of tea from Marvin and took a sip, her slender fingers holding the courier box. Leaning back on the sofa, she glanced at Marvin, lowered her voice, and raised an eyebrow. Why are you staring at me? He pointed to the package in her hand and curiously asked, Miss Miller, what's that? Bessie threw the package to him and placed the teacup on the coffee table. Without looking up, she took out her phone and said, Look for yourself. Marvin took a pair of scissors to open the package. Patrick, who was talking to Michael, also looked at him. After carefully tearing open the outer packaging, he saw a black book inside. It had a very ugly cover and a bunch of numbers he couldn't understand inside. He was speechless. Then, he remembered that Bessie was a hacker. He couldn't understand it. He stared at it for a while, closed it, handed it respectfully to Bessie and said expressionlessly, Miss Miller. The next day, it was finally Saturday, much to the netizens' joy. At 8 p.m., Bessie was downstairs in Marvin's room at the Highline Apartments. She was sitting on the carpet holding a pillow and leaning lazily against the sofa. Rosemary, Michael, and Marvin were all sitting on the sofa. Rosemary had been thinking about coming here to watch the premiere ever since she heard about Marvin's super large screen last time. Marvin sat at the very edge of the couch. At 7.59, Patrick walked out of his room silently, holding a glass of water. He walked to the edge of the sofa next to Marvin and sat down. Eating a potato chip, Marvin blankly looked up and said, Patrick, yeah? Patrick took a sip of water and absent-mindedly replied to him. Marvin ate more potato chips and glanced at him without speaking. His eyes seemed to be asking, Why are you here? Patrick didn't reply. He lowered his head and silently drank the water. At 8 o'clock, all the major channels would simultaneously broadcast in conjunction with the online APP platform. The title sequence with music played at the beginning of the show, and then the program name was displayed, 24-Hour Idol. At the same time, the synchronization meant the online netizens were appearing cheekily. Hello everyone, welcome to 8-Hour Idol. It's time to watch 8 Hours Idol again. The program began after the last episode had left off. It showed the moment when Ava met with Zeke. The netizens started commenting about Ava. I know this girl. She's the one who was on the hot search last month. Does everyone remember? Ava, I know her. This young lady looks very distinctive. I don't know why she has never been popular. She's actually not Northwestern University's school nerd, but is an entertainer. 
I've guessed wrong. Maybe the program group strictly forbade her from bringing school nerds. Ha ha ha, the stupid program group must have been afraid it would become two hour idle. On the screen, Bessie's eyes fell at the end of the road. And to Katie's question about what her other friend did, she casually replied, A singer. There were more comments. Singer? An entertainer as well? Why isn't he here yet? Is he late? I want to see who it is. Who dares to be late in front of big movie stars like this? At the same time, the scene cut to the end of the road, not far away. The production crew hadn't expected much from Bessie in the beginning, and the shots were mostly focused on Zeke and the others. Only one very distant full-field shot faced the remote road, which couldn't be seen clearly. While Bessie was talking to Katie, this shot had already captured the three blurry figures at the end of the road. As they approached, two of the people seemed to be assistants, who immediately avoided the camera. The audience could vaguely see Bessie's guest wearing sunglasses. Not all the comments were positive. This person even brought his assistance? Isn't the point that he's even wearing sunglasses? I inexplicably don't like this guest. This show isn't even a top big name, and the filming venue has already been booked by the show, so nobody will see him. Is he even more famous than Zeke? Pretentious. I don't like him either. Plus one. Indeed, his first impression isn't very good, but since he's invited by Bessie, I will watch it. Comment section, don't be so malicious, okay? He's just wearing a mask, not stealing your food. What if he has just caught a cold? I just want to see who it is. On the screen, a thin figure with his back facing the camera spoke with an almost clear and slightly ethereal voice. I'm sorry for coming late. As a singer... Other than his talents, Noah also had a unique voice. His personal mannerisms were distinctive in the music industry as well. Some musicians said that no one in the music world would be able to replicate his success. Hearing his voice dropped a bomb on the audience watching. Shit, I must have hallucinated. Me too. Stupid camera, what's wrong with you? Can't you move? Ah, I'm so anxious to see. Production crew, you're doing it on purpose, right? While everyone was anxiously commenting, the scene suddenly switched to Noah's face as he politely greeted Zeke. The young man lowered his eyes, his expression calm, beautiful, and somewhat obedient. Like a rookie. 24-Hour Idol had already been very popular initially and had completely exploded. Because of the story between Zeke and Bessie, Thus, the comment section had been densely filled at the beginning. However, at this time, the comment section on all the broadcast platforms suddenly stopped, as if the autumn wind had swept the fallen leaves, leaving only two or three comments. Ah! Ah! Then suddenly, the comments screen showed everyone's shock. Who am I? Where am I? What did I just see? I actually have the chance to see Noah on a reality show in my lifetime. I'm crying. Production crew, are you gods? This is really once in a lifetime. Production crew, I salute to you. Not much to say. This production crew is amazing. Isn't he Bessie's friend? Hurry, everyone. Hand the cigarette to the big boss. Before the program even ended, the hot search on Twitter had already updated. Episode 348, Northwestern University's School Nerd Noah and Two Kings in One Kingdom were the top searches. Twitter soon exploded. The overworked programmer who finally had time to watch the live broadcast at home was called back to work overtime as soon as it started. After all these years, Noah had become famous. He was initially popular for his music and later because of his distinct style in the entertainment industry. He didn't accept endorsements, commercials, or movies. He just wanted to do music and never tried to create hype on the internet. Fans could only see him through concerts and music videos. Someone had once made a post that described Noah by saying it was more difficult to watch him participate in non-music activities than it was to discover how the universe began. 
Although it was a joke, it also highlighted the difficulty of Noah appearing on shows. On the hot search, someone dug out that post, made by the account Appreciate One Drunk, and reposted it, saying, The only prophet in the audience. Turn on the lights, shine me to death. What the hell? Brother, you're famous. Open the door, Noah is really here. Naturally, many netizens didn't like to watch the real-time live stream and wanted to watch the replay after the broadcast. Many of Noah's fans only focused on him and were not paying attention to the show. Seeing the hot search that was almost paralyzed with results about Noah, they reluctantly opened the live stream. The popularity indicator displayed on the upper right corner of the live stream was increasing at an exponential speed. At this time, the program showed them dividing into teams and then heading off to find clues. On the sofa, Rosemary crossed her legs. She looked at the missions set by the production crew and smiled at Bessie. In order to turn the tides against you, the production crew will target you the whole time. She said, It was obvious that this episode was meant to make things harder for Bessie. She leaned back silently. Michael lazily raised an eyebrow. Turn the tides against her? Just look at how they gave shooting missions, slicing parts, paintings, and putting together components. It's so obvious they're trying to get her to fail. Rosemary picked up her teacup and felt like something was wrong with Michael's indifferent expression. The comments agreed with Rosemary. Ha 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 The production crew has expressed their fear. Well, it has been determined that this episode is indeed 24-hour idle. Bessie's group was relatively undisciplined, while Zeke's group had already found some clues from the shooting mission. Undoubtedly, many scenes were of Zeke. Sierra's performance was also remarkable, but because of everything that had happened last week, even if she did nothing, people were still mad that she existed in the show. The audience simply didn't want to see her and was convinced it was a setup even if she performed well. Does anyone remember the post on the forum about Bessie shooting during her military training? Someone in the comments asked. Me, I remember. Why didn't she go to clear the shooting mission? Is archery different from the shooting in military training? I just want to see Bessie's heroic shooting. However, on the screen, Bessie had already stated that she wouldn't participate in the shooting and gave it up to Zeke. She even took Ava and the others to see the ghosts in the old house. The production was well-funded and the ghost house's decorations were gloomy and terrifying. Bessie and her party of four had just entered the old house. Through the screen, the chill coming from the soles of their feet could be felt. A female ghost in a red wedding gown suddenly popped out. With a pale face and black hair hanging down, her face was covered, and only the back of her head could be seen. Even Rosemary was shocked, as if she was watching a horror movie. The comment section was full of shit, worried that Bessie and Noah would be scared to tears. However, they only saw Bessie directly walk past the female ghost, seemingly commenting on the old house. Noah and Ava politely asked the female ghost sister if there was a checkpoint here. Katie's cousin asked seriously, Can you twist your head off like in the movies? The female ghost was speechless. I guess not, you're just a copycat ghost. He was extremely disappointed. The female ghost was speechless. The real-time comments went wild. Ha 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 ha, to hell with this whole team of insensitive boys and girls. I feel distressed for the ghost sister, but I really want to die laughing. Online seeking the female ghost psychological thoughts. 20 minutes had passed since the beginning of the show, so almost a quarter of the episode was over. Zeke's group had two mission cards at this time. The comment section also began to get impatient. Zeke is spoiling his niece. He actually gave her the shooting missions card that he worked so hard to obtain. I mean, just look at her face. I also think they're just messing around, but I still like watching it. Ha 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 ha. Noah, your voice will be heard no matter what. The scene showed Bessie handing the barbecue to Noah. Then she typed a string of codes in the computer and a high-level clue popped up. The comment section was filled with question marks. 
The program slowly turned to Bessie, leading Ava and the others to the violin mission. Ha ha ha, they're finally doing a mission, but Zeke and the others have been there already. The old man at the mission point didn't even lift his head. It's a little difficult. The next second after this comment, the old man in the scene passed the advanced clues to Bessie very neatly. He also chatted familiarly with Ava. The audience was shocked. WTF? Shit, ha ha ha, it looks like Ava is a big boss in the violin world. Program group, are you anxious now? It'll only be for eight hours again today. I was wrong. Today's show is still eight hour idol. Zeke was watching the live stream with the people in the studio. Zeke and Bessie had been recorded separately on this episode, so other than the last game clue, neither he nor his manager knew how she had obtained the high-level clues. They were especially surprised since Zeke and his team had been to the violin checkpoint as well, but Mr. Sampson standing guard there hadn't even lifted his head. Among the audience, some people recognized Mr. Sampson. How rich is the production crew to even invite Mr. Sampson? As one of the violin teachers in the Evanston Violin Association, Mr. Sampson's status in the violin world wasn't low. A few comments on the comment section asked the same thing. This is Mr. Sampson? I will sternly remind everyone online, everyone, go search Evanston Violin Association. Some people had already noticed this comment, but most people were still watching the live stream and didn't exit the screen. In Zeke's studio, the manager sipped his coffee and finally got to see the answer to the unsolved mystery at the violin mission point. Oh, it turns out to be because of Ava. Her violin playing must have been very impressive. Yeah. Zeke looked at the phone in his hands, his expression calm and elegant as always. The production crew naturally wouldn't air Mr. Sampson's conversation with the director. Without understanding the inside information, and with Mr. Sampson continuously talking to Ava, most people assumed that he had given them the high-level clue because of her. The show moved on to the lunch scene. There was a close-up shot of the hotel discounts for the poker tournament levels. I have confirmed with my eyes this production crew is a fan of the poker tournament. It's over. Noah only does music. Zeke is also an old man. Katie is a stubborn scrap iron. Bessie, Noah, and the others ordered a whole table of dishes. On the screen, Zeke gave a very slow answer. Marriage can wait a few years. It's not on my mind for now. After finishing the meal, everyone in the comments section was waiting for them to wash the plates. The whole screen was filled with ha 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 until Bessie sat in front of the computer and logged into her account. Supreme level. 20 stars. The screen of ha 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 immediately disappeared. The whole comment section was instantly at a loss. Because the camera was a little far and the computer screen wasn't big, the scene only just flashed by. Most people only noticed her hand speed and not when Toby invited her to play. The production crew also very coldly didn't zoom in on this. Bessie's game lasted for only eight minutes and the production crew had to reluctantly cut it into half, including the replay of the game. After watching the live stream, Zeke stood up, absent-mindedly plucked at his sleeves, and then drove Tucker home. Tucker. He took his key and walked them out before asking, Do you like computers? Putting his phone in his pocket and wrapping his scarf around his neck, Tucker remained silent and only nodded. Zeke opened the door for Tucker and then got into the driver's seat, turning to look at him. I'll find you another impressive teacher. You're so smart, you should understand what Jack and I want you to do. You have the chance to make a decision. Got it. Tucker lowered his head and slowly played a game on his phone. That was his way of expressing his agreement. Good. You're just like part of the Miller family. Zeke reached out to caress his head. Glancing out of the window, his clear eyes darkened. We're going to have a big war next. Don't worry. The fourth son would find out about Tucker's existence eventually. He had to find a way to fight against the fourth son. 
After Zeke and Tucker left, the studio fell into silence. This pair of siblings is very impressive at games. Is Bessie really that good? Someone asked. The people in the studio basically all played the poker tournament, which had swept the whole world. The manager calmly took a sip of coffee and glanced at the others. Watching the live stream wasn't as exciting as seeing it in real life. He shrugged. I don't know. The netizens will find out. He took another sip of coffee. He was also curious, but he didn't dare to ask. But the netizens were a magnifying glass. The studio people silently lowered their heads, took out their phones, and opened the video app. They clicked on 24 Hour Idol and rewatched the last 10 minutes. Just like them, the majority of the netizens were rewatching the broadcast. Amongst these people, there were naturally fans of the poker tournament. Some people also remembered the comments about Mr. Sampson and went to search for the Evanston Violin Association. Netizens always went over programs with a magnifying glass and couldn't wait to pull out all the antics from celebrities for examination. Episode 349 Angry Netizens At the Highline Apartments, Rosemary and the others had also finished watching the show. Shall we go see your brother tomorrow? Michael got up from the sofa. He casually pulled Bessie up as well. Bessie still had the black book with her. Getting up, she threw aside the pillow in her arms and followed him upstairs, her hands casually holding the book. I'll see. These past two days, she had been studying the experimental project between her and Principal White. The two continued talking and headed upstairs. Behind them, Rosemary and Patrick exchanged glances. They were a little surprised. Although they didn't play games professionally, they understood the situation after seeing Supreme Level 20 Stars pop up on Bessie's account, as well as the stunned comment section and how the internet blew up afterward. Only Marvin watched the show expressionlessly. How was Bessie's level so high? Rosemary folded her arms and lowered her voice. She remembered Sherry only had one star. Rosemary didn't play games but Sherry had been popular in Evanston. So she had mentioned it to Rosemary and Sebastian when she attended their banquet. Marvin finished his bag of chips and threw the trash into the trash can. Hearing this, he simply shook his head. He didn't know. Rosemary looked away and left thoughtfully after bidding farewell to Bessie and Michael. At the same time on Twitter, someone had edited together a video from all the clips of Bessie playing. They posted it with the caption, A school nerd comparable to professional players. The hot search for this rose to second place after Noah. Other than his fans, other poker tournament fans also clicked on the video. I edited the footage of the restaurant, questioned by the game masters. This can be on the hot search as well. This Sierra is only a one-star level and is considered good in the entertainment industry, but in the esports circle, she's only an ordinary passerby. At this thought, the comment section suddenly went crazy. Nuclear energy warning ahead. Famous scene. Watch it a billion times. Bessie's large-scale slaughter of fans on the scene. I recommend you to pause at 234, 250, and 327 to watch the game interface. Bessie's hand speed is too fast. Try watching it a few more times. Some netizens couldn't download it and just went straight to the comment section. Sure enough, three screenshots were found in the most popular comment. First screenshot. Toby invited Bessie to play a game. Second screenshot. Bessie's game friends. The first page was all supreme level and above. Third screenshot. Her record. The netizens went crazy over these screenshots. I'm crying. She has god-level friends. She's probably played with the sun god. How did she get 20 stars? What kind of girl is she? After they worshipped the game gods, some people became microscopes and began to examine the video. Erm, does anyone remember the final tour of the Devil City OST competition last year? Don't guess. I'll just tell you. At BM. 
There are too few old fans. Many have forgotten the winter game that abused their hearts four years ago. Let me point the way to Poker Tournament's official goods store. The hotel owner is a first-generation fan. I'm crying. Neither Zeke nor the program team expected Twitter to explode again within an hour after the broadcast. They were still in Zeke's studio. Because of the broadcast today, the studio people had been working overtime for fear of trouble. But fortunately, no trouble was caused after the broadcast. They were preparing to pack their things and leave work. The person in charge of the studio's official Twitter was surprised to see the private messages and the increasing number of fans on his page. So many comments? Some people had followed this Twitter because of watching the show. The manager knew that some netizens had already dug out the show editing where Toby invited Bessie. Not surprised, he calmly asked, Was Toby exposed? The staff was silent. What's wrong? With no work tonight, the manager had put on his coat and was prepared to head home. Seeing the staff's reaction, he couldn't help but pause and ask again. A staff member turned his head silently and reached out to hand his phone to the manager. They did dig out Toby, but there's something else. Look at it. The manager reached out for the phone. Twitter's hot search had just been updated again. He originally thought that it would be either Toby or Bessie on the hot search. But unexpectedly, neither of them was there. Even Noah's post that had occupied the hot search for two hours had been successfully squeezed to the fourth spot. The first three spots were all about the poker tournament. The World Poker Tour's best player, BM, OST Toby Yearling's Winter Game. What was this weird hot search? It had squeezed Noah's show post out of the first place. Noah was one of the most famous people in the entertainment industry and was a particularly mysterious singer. It was imaginable how much traffic a famous star like him, who never participated in shows, would bring by suddenly showing up. Although two hours had